Hi, I'm Stian, and I will be presenting a deep dive on dependency confusion. This is joint work together with Stoller Petition and Alexander Schell in the Shipster product and application security team. So the term dependency confusion was coined by Alex Burson um, in a blog post he published in February of this year. There he talked about how he used the technique to hack a number of companies, including Apple and Microsoft. So when we became aware of the issue in Chipster, we, we spent quite a bit of time uh, mitigating it. And in this presentation, I'll cover uh, how you can figure out if you're affected by dependency confusion and also steps you can take to, to mitigate it. So the dependencies we are talking about is typically uh, third-party libraries that you include in your projects, uh, often called um, packages. And uh, you'll pull them in via package managers like um, npm, pip, and, and maven. So as in this example, um, like third-party libraries is usually a, a big part of the project. So you might uh, include a lot of third-party libraries and those in turn have their own dependencies. So it can be quite a bit um, of um, attack surface. And of course, uh, dependency confusion is just uh, one of many ways to be compromised through your dependencies. So these are in general referred to as uh, supply chain issues. And there's a bunch listed here, like different backdoors, type of scotting, etc. Uh, but in this talk, we'll focus on dependency confusion. So for there to be dependency confusion, uh, there's two main ingredients uh, that need to be present. The first is um, ambiguity in um, when you, you specify your dependencies. Uh, so for, for the um, uh, identifier to be unique, it, it should include the repository, uh, the scope, the package name, and version. So, so an sort of exact example would be to have the URL for the repository, uh, have a scope like the company name, and then the package name, and then the exact version. While in practice, we often only the uh, fine um, uh, the package name and uh, the version range, um, the, the version rather might be a range uh, and not be exact like in this case uh, with the patch version being open. So the second ingredient is that uh, the package manager needs to be configured in such a way that uh, the ambiguity of the, the package can be exploited. So in this case, we have two upstreams and uh, you uh, when you specify uh, the package you want, it might be uh, like this, uh, my package 1.0.star, uh, and you're expecting to get this my package 1.0.0, but um, you might actually get my package 1.0.999, which is controlled by the attacker. Uh, so in this case, the, um, uh, the highest version would win, and the attacker would choose uh, uh, a bunch of nines to make sure that they would have the highest version. Um, so this is one way there can be confusion, but there, there could also be others like um, uh, the ordering, uh, the, the repositories are included, for instance. So this is the general gist of dependency confusion. Um, in practice, it's uh, often a bit more complicated. So in this case, it, it's more like uh, the setup in ships than also the, the different companies that was mentioned in the original blog post. As in, instead of just having upstream repositories, uh, we also have an internal repository manager uh, where we might have our own internal packages. And we might also have proxies um, that proxy upstream repositories. Um, and on top of this, we can have virtual repositories that can uh, reference one or more uh, of the other repository types. So, uh, and as we see, like there's here, there's several places that can be confusion. Like, should you go internal or external? Um, which of the external should you use? And also, which of the internal should you use? Um, so this is all the the backdrop in the the normal case where where um, 
dependency confusion might be an issue. So the attacker's goal here would be to publish a package upstream um, that would match the package name of an internal package. And you might think that uh, guessing the package name or finding the package name they should uh, choose might be hard, um, but this is what um, is shown in the original blog post, that it's it's practical to, to find these package names. You might also think that it's a challenge to, to produce a package that wouldn't um, produce runtime or compile time errors. Um, but fortunately for, for the attacker at least, uh, some package managers like npm uh, allow arbitrary code execution uh, on package install, uh, so that uh, uh, that simplifies things for, for the attacker. So, uh, and then of course you would run in the context of like a, a build server or a developer laptop, which would be very useful. So given how straightforward uh, this attack is, it's sort of peculiar that it uh, only recently become, uh, became an issue people um, well, mitigate in the industry. So, uh, of course, there's a, a lot of different package managers uh, that are affected by this. And uh, we have a bunch in, in ships that we had to mitigate for. And, and you can see more details in our blog post. Uh, in this presentation, I'll focus mostly on uh, Artifactory uh, and, and, uh, and BEM. So, uh, here uh, we have npm virtual, which is uh, uh, points uh, to, to, to other repositories. So we have the npm local, which is our internal packages. And then we have npm remote, which is a proxy for npmjs.com. Uh, and uh, you can point to either of these three. And of course, uh, in terms of getting dependency confusion between these two, uh, you would have to point to the virtual, which then points to the two others. Uh, and you would not have confusion if you only pointed on um, uh, the internal, for instance, the npm local. So here's a sort of concrete example. So say that we have configured npm to uh, fetch from the npm virtual repository. And uh, say that we, we in our package.json, we have a dependency, Babel preset internal uh, with this version, which is a version range um, um, on the um, uh, minor version. And um, let's also assume that in our internal repository, we do have Babel preset internal uh, with version 0.1.1. So what the attacker would do is, uh, is they would go to npmjs.com and re register the same package name upstream um, and make sure that they have a higher uh, version, uh, which might be uh, 0.1.2. And when the developer then runs npm update, uh, the malicious package would be installed. So one uh, approach to mitigate this is to reserve uh, your internal package names upstream. Um, this is something uh, we've done. Um, uh, but it is not in the spirit of the terms of use for, for the repositories. So um, it might um, be might not be something you can continue to do. Um, so like in the case you, you can't quite trust upstreams or you, you want to have extra security in, in this regard, you can also do a denial list internally. So you say that uh, this package uh, that you register up, upstream as a dummy package is also deni deny listed in your internal repository manager. Uh, but then, of course, the, the path needs to go through your internal uh, repository manager and not directly to the upstreams to, to be effective. Uh, only going to your internal is, is uh, regardless a good idea because it gives you um, better uh, insight into the packages that are used. Um, because um, the, the remotes are cached and you can also get usage uh, statistics, um, which is um, you know, convenient. 
So, um, for MPEM specifically, because they support scopes rather than reserving uh, the exact package name of upstream, you could um, reserve a scope instead. So, so say that um, uh, we have the ship to scope and we make sure that uh, the package is in that scope and that we own that scope uh, upstream. So, so you will go to mpmjs.com and see, are you already the owner of the scope ship stud? Uh, if not, can we get ownership? Or maybe uh, there's already malicious code uh, published to that, that scope. Uh, and also sort of do the cleanup, making sure uh, that, that all packages are moved into scopes uh, you own. So uh, another um, sort of complementary approach would be to do uh, allow listing um for for scopes per source so here we say that okay uh, we want uh, the ships the scope should only come from the internal repository while everything else can come from from the virtual repository which might either be internal or or uh, result to, to upstream uh, you could also set allow listing for the remotes. This is useful in cases where uh, you don't fully trust the upstreams. The upstreams might be like a single project. This is more common for, for Maven. Uh, but then you might only trust um, the, the repository for a given project with the prefixes for, for that project. And then you don't have to worry uh, about other software coming in that way. So um, for the local, uh, or uh, rather like uh, on set, setting the, the allow listing um, in your build, this is how we do it for MPM. So you would say that the, the general registry is, is the MPM virtual, the general one. Uh, but then you say uh, for the scope ships there, it's the MPM local. And this is of course in contrast with only setting the re registry to be MPM virtual, uh, which then um, uh, could lead to dependency confusion. So uh, our preferred simple case uh, is to like, it covers when the package managers uh, uh, support uh, scopes. And the simplest would be to make sure that you only go through uh, your repository manager and that you reserve the scope uh, upstream. And this is also simpler for like NPM where it's usual to only have one uh, upstream uh, repo. So this simplifies things. Um, another approach, so when the dependency confusion became a thing uh, this spring, uh, JFrog came up with the um, mitigation they call priority resolution. Like if this works for you, uh, great, uh, but it, it has some drawbacks. So it works by um, uh, basically setting priority resolution on an internal repository, and then any package in that repository will never be fetched um, uh, via a remote. So, uh, the downside is that if you have an internal fork or, or like single version um, patch of a, an external project, and that will also block like any other version of that project being fetched via the remote. Also, if you have a project that started out uh, internally and then became open source, uh, it will also break uh, those projects. So one solution could be to split them and you have one internal for those that are definitely internal, where you set priority resolution and then have a separate internal repository for uh, the projects where you have to be able to fetch both the internal versions and the upstream versions. So, and so this was a uh, J4 artifactory, but um, um, Sonotype Nexus also have a similar. Uh, uh, functionality in, in their firewall um, product, uh, where you can sort of do it more fine grained so instead of saying uh, all the packages in this, this repository, you can set it per package instead. So Microsoft uh, proposed a different solution. Basically, don't have 
uh, upstreams at all, only use internal packages. So this would require you to maintain uh, internal copies of the project, either by building from source or otherwise handling um, uh, internal version of, of all the projects you need. Uh, so like this, this is a good solution to sort of have good overview of all your uh, dependencies, but it might be too um, resource intensive for, for a lot of companies to actually uh, do this. So here like a summary of the preferred complex case. So this is when you can't, um, uh, like you, you don't have the scopes, for instance. Uh, so like if you can use priority resolution, great. Um, otherwise, you might want to do a mix of uh, reserve scopes or packages upstream, use the nihilist list and allow list for the remotes in your repository manager, as well as uh, setting uh, allow list uh, for scopes per, per source in your project. And you would probably want to, um, to only go through and the internal repository manager to, to make sure that you, you get some audit capabilities. So here we have some of the package systems we, we looked at. Uh, so as you can see, uh, some of them support scopes, others not. So of course it's, it's easier when, when they do support scopes. PIP is one of those that doesn't support scopes, uh, which makes it tedious to go and, and register all the package names uh, upstream. So one, one thing to note here is that um, most of them that, that do support scopes, uh, and no one is free to, to register any scope. Um, so then, then you have to be first, like before the um, attacker, to, to register it. But for, for Maven Central, which is the main one for, for Maven and Gradle, uh, you actually um, they, they use uh, uh, DNS so that you have to prove that you own, for instance, chipstead.com um, for the um, uh, group ID com.chipstead. Uh, so this is useful so that not anyone can can uh, get at your scope. So so if you all already use um, good um, scopes, uh, then you sort of uh, secure uh, to a larger extent in, in the um, Maven world. Um, and basically, so th this you know, took a lot of time to go through this, and, and we, we did register se several hundred uh, packages upstream in addition to, to scopes uh, for these different uh, packages uh, systems. So uh, our approach then to, to go through and, and, and clean up, like if, if you're starting out, um, like you can go through all packages and check if they do exist upstream. Uh, if not, you can reserve the package name and or scopes, and you can uh, add the denial list. So um, if they do exist upstreams, you can you should check if you, you, you are the owner or maybe you can get the ownership. Um, so for instance, uh, we, we had some that um, so packages that were owned by ex employees that we could get ownership back of. Um, you can also check that, um, like, is there already a malicious package there, uh, and, and check if you're if you're compromised. Uh, there's also some small projects where uh, they're sort of they're they're no longer maintained, and you don't think you're going to need it then it might be still be useful to deny list it internally if you're unable to, to rename the package uh, internally to, to avoid that conflict. And of course, like moving and, and renaming stuff might be required to, to get a, a clean setup. So in, in addition to going through all the internal packages, we can also go through the remotes and, and make sure that we, we don't have any remotes we shouldn't have and also restrict some of them uh, based on, on uh, scope or prefix um, to make sure that they, they can only uh, publish packages that are relevant for, for that remote. Uh, and then unfortunately, like based on your setup, you have, might have to continuously look for new internal packages or scopes and make sure that you go through the same process uh, to secure those. Uh, so this is 
depending on the solution, this is a, like an ongoing thing. You have to make sure that uh, you're covered. And then, of course, like if you can use priority resolution, it, it, it might be uh, useful to you. And hopefully there, there'll be more uh, useful tools from, from the vendors in the future. So uh, some resources. Uh, we do have a, a blog post with more, more details on this. Um, we also have an open source tool called Artishock that is useful to do some of the steps I, I just went through in the setting of Artifactory. Uh, there's also a, a tool from Visma called Confused, which is more centric on like you have one project and you can detect um, if, if that project uh, has uh, packages that are not claimed upstream. So with that, um, I would like to say that we, we are hiring a cloud security engineer and I'm happy to take questions.